Good morning, CCDA. Good morning. Oh, come on now. Good morning, CCDA. Good morning. There we go. I arrived last night after a 20-hour flight from the Middle East, and I was tired. And then I got here, and the hotel was buzzing with all this energy and activity, a whole new generation of people who are excited about changing their neighborhoods, their nation, and their world. And you woke me up. So you got to wake up this morning. I've got two boys, 13 and 8, and I think I should start bringing them to CCDA. Yeah. Because they care about the stuff that you care about. Some of you know that we're kind of a baseball family. My boys are in the baseball, and I get to be a Little League coach. And I was remembering this morning, a few weeks ago, we had a Sunday morning baseball conflict with Jack between church and baseball. And Jack said, now, Dad, don't get me wrong. I really do appreciate God. It's just the church is boring. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not boring here. That's why I want to bring them. There are stories about how people are changing their neighborhoods. Stories about how God is changing your neighborhoods and how God wants justice. Amen? Amen. Also wasn't boring to a place I went last week. I was in New York City to help Lisa launch her new book, read her book, it's a good book, Left, Right, and Christ. But I thought, while in New York, let me visit these young occupiers on Wall Street. So we did, and we had an amazing time. Now they're in 1,400 places around the country. So I thought I should meet them and listen to them and talk to them. And like all of us, I found, they're hungry for change. And like Jack, they're, they're not sure about, they think church is boring too, but on Sunday, they wheeled in this, on Wall Street, a big golden calf. Really, a big paper mache golden bull. On the side, it said, false idol. Then they be began chanting the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor! <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers! Have you ever had, seen a church chanting the Beatitudes? Wow. I think we should start that in our churches. <laughs> chanting the Beatitudes. Wow. Now they want to have services on Sunday at Occupy Wall Street. I think, you know, we're not going to be able to endorse everything that's said and done, but it isn't about endorsing, it's about engaging. What do church folks do? We take down covered casserole dishes. We have potlucks. Sit, talk, listen, talk about God, talk about what God's doing. I wrote a letter to them on the way home on the plane. It'll be on HuffPost this afternoon. I wrote, whatever you may think about organized religion, please keep in mind the change requires spiritual as well as political resources. And inevitably, I said, any new economy will be accompanied by a new and very old spirituality. We have something to say to them. Let's engage these young people. Interestingly enough, the meetings I was in in the Middle East, very different. The World Economic Forum was having a meeting, a thousand business leaders, and I discovered that whether you're sleeping on, you know, feather beds in five-star hotels or pup tents on the cement in Liberty Square, the discussion was about the same questions, about an economy that has become unfair, unsustainable, unstable, and is making many, many people unhappy.
When Arthur and I began having this conversation, oh, by the way, we don't call it a debate. We call it a dialogue. We're having this conversation around the country. The issues at Wheaton College where we began were more theoretical. Now we have, I think, some stark choices. Let me be blunt and political for a moment. The Republicans in Washington are proposing budget cuts where two-thirds of the proposed cuts are going to come from low-income people. Two-thirds. And let me make myself clear, reducing the deficit is a moral issue. My sons, Jack and Luke, I don't want them shackled with debt the rest of their lives, but I want to say this, how you reduce a deficit is also a moral issue. And who pays the price is a moral issue. Who bears the load? Who suffers the brunt? That's a moral issue, too. Now, the Democrats, they're saying, well, yeah, but maybe cut a little bit less. A little bit less. That's all they're saying. Neither political party is saying, don't you do this on the backs of our poorest and most vulnerable people. That's our job. That's our message. And so we have formed something called a circle of protection. It includes the Roman Catholic bishops, the National Association of Evangelicals, the Salvation Army, known to be a religious left group, <laughs> Bread for the World, CCDA, and Sojourners to say, we're talking to Republicans and Democrats and saying, first of all, the money isn't with poor people. Go where the money is. But you know, when the president said, maybe we should cut uh, those uh, deductions for corporate tax jets, remember that he said that? Within 48 hours, New York Times, corporate jet industry mobilizes. Who mobilizes for poor people? Where are the firms on K Street? They're there to defend women and children and nutrition programs. Where are they? Arthur and I were talking before this session. There are three pharmaceutical lobbyists now for every member of Congress. That's only one industry. Who will defend the poor? I am proud to say the faith community is stepping up, forming a circle of protection. So we're meeting with the leaders of both parties. We met with the president in the White House. His team is on one side. He's there. We're on the other side. It's always great to have the NAE on one side of you, the Salvation Army on the other side of you, in the White House. Because they all want to defend the middle class, because that's where the votes are. So a Catholic bishop looked at the president and said, Mr. President, you're always better when you go off script. <laughs> Mr. President, the text that we are obliged to obey does not say, as you've done to the middle class, you've done to me. It says, as you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. That is Matthew 25. That text brought me to Jesus Christ, and that text still brings me to Christ. And that text should be the defining metric of everything that we say on the stage today. Because God doesn't judge nations by their gross national product, by their military firepower, or how much their popular culture is the envy of the world. God says, I will judge you by how you treat the most vulnerable in your midst. That's our metric. That's our job. That's our job. The scriptures make it clear. This debate, you know, it's all about choices. Choices. So they want to cut $8.5 billion from low-income housing. But they want to keep $8.4 billion for deductions on second vacation homes. They want to cut $2.5 billion for home heating oil. 
poor families in the wintertime. You know those families. They'll get cold without that help. But they want to keep $2.5 billion, same amount of money, for subsidies, for offshore drilling, for oil companies, making record profits. This is a matter of choices. Who's important? Who's not? Who has the lobbyists and who doesn't? Ask your member of Congress. I'll ask Arthur to today. Is every line item of military spending, every one, more important than the 10.4 malaria bed nets they're about to cut that keep kids alive in Africa? Or all the vaccinations that without which kids are just going to die. Let me be clear, the circle of protection is for long-term deficit reduction. We are, and we're for economic growth. The best way out of poverty is jobs, jobs, jobs. We believe that. But we have cut taxes on the wealthy, have deregulated Wall Street and their finance business for decades, and they have not, that has not produced jobs. It's produced an economic crisis and a recession. And now something so deep, it brings our children to the streets. Now, they have been engaged in Wall Street in what some would call greedy and risky behavior. Now, I want to tell you, those words come to me from those who work on the inside. Well, I was with again this week, we, we can. They, they come to me like Nicodemus at night. <laughs> they do. And they say, Jim, what you're saying about this, the only problem is it's even worse on the inside than you say. They say, when finance is an area of the economy was once 10% of the economy and now is 40%, the Citibank trader in Wall Street said, that's wrong, Jim. We're just money's making money, not making work, or jobs, or things that people need. The National Federal Independent Bureau just reached a study, uh, uh, released a study saying the number one reason why companies aren't hiring is not taxes and not regulations. It's lack of demand. Lack of demand, lack of jobs, lack of economic activity. That's what's not here. Wall Street, the kids have a slogan now. They say, we're part of the 99%. 1%, 99. Think about it. 1% of the country now control 40% of the wealth of the nation. And the top 400 most wealthy people in America 400 families control more than the bottom 50% of the country. The times of great inequality have been two in our time. One, the year before the Great Depression, and now 2008, the year before the Great Recession. God doesn't mind prosperity as long as it is shared. That's what God asked for. There's a biblical principle for officially, governmentally even, protecting the poor. What do you think gleaning, the, leaving the edges of the fields for the poor meant? That was to protect the poor, provide economic activity for them. Jubilee, this periodic redistribution of wealth. I talked to business people this weekend in Abu Dhabi about how the economy needs correction like Jubilee. Periodic, yes, redistribution, making the pl playing field more level again. Necessary correctives. Last time we had a big budget debate in Washington, in the last administration, I was here speaking at CCDA. I did an altar call, come to Washington. We're going to pray on the steps of the Cannon Office Building. Nothing we had said had made any difference. Half of the 110 people arrested that day were from CCDA. 
bunch of troublemakers. <laughs> they included John Perkins. I asked John to speak before we got arrested that night. He was the elder. He was the oldest one being busted that day. <laughs> Many of us will never forget what John said to us. He said, my mother died of a nutrition deficiency. I was seven months old, an infant nursing at her breast. And for years, I believed that I had killed my mother. And later I realized, years later, that it wasn't me. Sharecropping killed my mother. Unjust laws killed my mother. A society that wanted poor black women to work for them but didn't care enough to feed them, killed my mother. John said, that's why I'm here. They're going to cut nutrition programs that support the poor, help people get out of poverty. They're going to cut food stamps, so I'm here. It's my last stand, he said. Gratefully, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. John's still here, inspiring us all. Gratefully, it wasn't. Noel and I were talking a week or two ago, and he said, when you live and work among the poor, you run into injustice. When you live and work among the poor, like all you do, you run into injustice. Poverty isn't just an accident or an unfortunate tragedy. It's got causes. It's got systems, interests, wealth, and power. Injustice, oppression are biblical words. William Wilberforce didn't say, let's just have all the Christians in England not own slaves. He said, well, you got to end the slave trade. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't say, let's just let all the Americans be nice to people and let them eat at the Christian lunch counters. He said, we have to end the system of Jim Crow. Segregation, it is wrong. It's got to end. The prophets, listen to who they speak to, always. The Hebrew prophets, they speak to rulers, kings, employers, Judges, those in charge, what do they speak about? <laughs> Widows, orphans, debtors, workers, families left out, left behind. And what are their topics? Land, labor, capital, wages, unfair court decisions. This is the stuff of our public life. So now when I conclude with this, we met with the president, <laughs> and I said, Mr. President, I've got a good text for you when you have these meetings with legislators. It's Isaiah 10. It says, woe to you legislators who passed unjust laws, who deny the poor among my people of their rights, a right to get out of poverty. He said, that's a good text. <laughs> They won't cut corporate tax loopholes, billions every year. They won't cut the costs of their wars. They won't make the wealthy pay their fair share, but they will defund the life-saving activities of World Vision, and they're going to, of Catholic Relief Services, and they're going to, of clinics on the west side of Chicago, coach. They're going to defund your medical clinics, and all of CCDA stuff that shows partnership with governments can work. And they're going to fund, Gary Hogan tells me, 25% of the efforts to stop trafficking in the world. They're going to fund all of that. In the middle of that, middle of that, the biggest religious issue in this election season just came out. It wasn't abortion, gay marriage. It was the census numbers on poverty. 50 million Americans now live below the poverty line. That's the most in 50 years. Poverty line, $22,000 for a family of four. Try living on that for a while. And you know what? And here's the big news they did, didn't report. Of those below the poverty line, three out of four have jobs. Have jobs. Half of them are working full time. 
Mm. They don't have a job that can support a family. They've got jobs. So CCDA, don't just be a charitable arm of voluntary service, cleaning up the mess left by wealth and power, putting Band-Aids on the sores of injustice. In Washington, D.C. today, they are slashing the safety nets that protect the poor and enable people to lift themselves out of poverty. They're cutting all that while protecting the wealthy. That's the opposite of what they should be doing, protecting the poor, advancing opportunity, and letting the wealthy take care of themselves, which they do pretty well. That's not the opinion just of Jim Wallace and Sojourners, but of the National Conference of Catholic Bishops, the National Association of Evangelicals, the Salvation Army, the, all of us in the faith community. The wealthy will look after themselves. They always have and they always will. Our calling is to stand up for justice. Our calling is to stand up for righteousness. And John Perkins, our calling is that text you love to quote all the time. I think John has said this more than Amos. Our calling is to let justice roll down like waters and righteous like an ever mighty flowing stream. That's our calling. This can't be a debate. You all are so friendly to each other. <laughs> it's an honor to be with you here today. Thank you so much. It's also an honor for me to be here with Jim Wallace. I'm humbled to be before this, this uh, group that's doing so much important work, uh, important work for God, important work for our country. Uh, it makes me very proud to be with you here today. Jim and I have been having a conversation going on for the past six months or so that's going to continue this year to talk about the moral choices that we face in our public policies. And this is something that's on my mind a lot and on your mind a lot too, as we watch television and we're in Washington, D.C. and we see the debates of our day. Uh, I, I, I'm the president of a think tank in Washington, D.C. that does nothing more than talk about the right public policies. And there's some days I have to tell you that I go home and I say, I don't think that the debates that we're having are really getting at what we're trying to get at. It reminds me of a, an old story. Uh, an economist like me uh, was one day leaving Washington, D.C., trying to get out into the country to, to relax, to get away from it all. And immediately getting outside the city, he got lost on a country road. Driving down the country road, he came to a farmhouse and decided to stop for directions. The economist knocked on the door. The farmer opened the door and said, what can I do for you? And he said, well, I'm lost. I, and he said, I can see that. You're obviously from the city. He said, yeah, can you give me directions back? So the farmer did, and, and he thanked the farmer. As he turned to leave, he noticed on the side of the house there was a field of sheep. And he always on the lookout for a profit-making opportunity, being an economist, he said, sir, if I can tell you exactly the right number of sheep in that field, will you give me one? The farmer said, of course. I mean, that's ridiculous. You can't tell me exactly how many sheep there are. And he looked quickly and, and applying a number of his, uh, his uh, estimates and heuristics as a professional economist, he quickly came to exactly the right number. He said, so you, sir, have 863 sheep. The farmer said, that's amazing. That's exactly right. I, I don't know how you knew that. But being a man of his word, he invited the economist to go take one. So the economist went into the flock of sheep, and he picked one out, and he was walking back to his car. And the farmer said, just a second, before you leave, Let's make a deal again. If I can tell you what you do for a living, can I have my sheep back? The economist said, there's no way you could know that. There's no way you could know what I do for a living. Sure, you're on. He says, you, sir, are an economist. He said, that's amazing. How did you know that? He said, because you gave me exactly the right number of sheep, but you're walking off with my dog. That's what it feels like in Washington, D.C. today. We're getting this number of sheep right, but we're walking off with the dog. 
we're having materialistic conversations about moral matters. Today, 81% of Americans are dissatisfied with the way our country is being governed. That is a new record in public opinion polling. Two weeks ago, Gallup found this. 81% of it, now in most countries, if 81% are dissatisfied with the way we're being governed, the president is getting airlifted off the top of the presidential palace to get away. But not in America, and that's good. The last record was 72% the week the market melted down in 2008, and before that the record was 66% the week that Nixon resigned over Watergate. We have never seen it this bad, certainly in my adult lifetime, and not since records have been kept. Why? Well, the economy's in the tank, the government's growing and it doesn't seem to be doing anything, people are dissatisfied because the government is too big, or as Jim suggests, the government's doing the wrong thing, and all of this is frustrating. But actually, it's an opportunity. Because now Americans are ready to have a moral conversation of the basis of our system, of the basis of our free enterprise system. Now, as Christian people, you and I know that morality matters first over materialism. We're taught that since we were little kids. Not everybody knows that. This is our teaching moment to remind other people what's written on their hearts too even though they haven't been taught that, that morality matters. And there's a huge body of scientific evidence that suggests and tells us that morality has a much bigger impact on people than materialism, than on economic arguments. If you can make the moral case for what you believe and somebody else has simply a material rejoinder to that, you win. We have to be ready with the moral case. It's kind of shocking that we've forgotten that in a lot of our debates because our founders knew that. America's founders knew that absolutely. You remember by heart the second paragraph from the Declaration of Independence, that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now what you might not know is that that language was adapted from a document written three weeks earlier called the Virginia Declaration of Rights, written by George Mason. The Virginia Declaration of Rights was very similar, but it had one little difference. The three unalienable rights from our creator were life, liberty, and the possession of property. Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, three weeks later, considered that clause and substituted the pursuit of happiness for the possession of property. How come? Because they knew that we had to move from materialism to morality if we were going to motivate people to struggle for the greatest experiment in liberty in the history of the world. And as it was true then, it is still true today. If you want people to struggle for what is right, for what is just, for what is moral, you better make that moral argument. And that's what we need to do today. No matter how you see the crisis that we're in, no matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican or a conservative or liberal, you better be ready with the moral case. So, here's the question. What did our founders mean when they talked about the pursuit of happiness? Because that was their moral promise to you and me. That was the moral promise we're supposed to leave to everybody else, my kids and grandkids. Jim likes to talk about his two sons. I have two sons and a daughter and I talk about them all the time too because that's why we're doing what we're doing here, as well as our brothers and sisters who don't happen to be in our immediate families. So what is the pursuit of happiness? I've asked a lot of people that. A lot of people come up with an answer that involves something about money. Is the pursuit of happiness the pursuit of money? The answer is no. And I say that not philosophically. I tell you that as an economist. One of the funny things that we find looking at the connections between money and happiness, is if you go back to 1972, since records have been kept, you'll find that the average American is 150% richer in real purchasing power than he or she was in 1972. But the average level of happiness hasn't changed. If you look at the level of the individual, it turns out to be the same way. Now, money can alleviate a lot of discomfort, and in point of fact, the very poor will be made happier with less discomfort, and with more resources. I'm gonna come back to this in a second, because I'm gonna make the argument very soon that if you believe in free enterprise, that is not incompatible with a strong and reliable social safety net. But I'm gonna come back to that. 
One of the things that we find is by the time you get past the level of subsistence, money truly doesn't buy happiness for you as an individual either, as we look at data on people's lives. We even have data on what happens when people who are very poor suddenly get rich. Do they get happier? The answer is no. We have data on lottery winners. That's a very interesting group, lottery winners, because most people who play the lottery are poor. And they get very rich if they hit it. So how much happier do they get? There's an old party game where you don't know each other at a party and try to break the ice. You go around the room and each one says, if you hit the lottery, what would you do? People always say really nice things. You know, I'd move someplace sunny. I'd get a job I really liked. I'd spend more time with my family. People never say things like, I'd probably marry somebody who doesn't love me, and then I'd start an alcoholic spiral. Nobody ever says stuff like that, you know, if they, if they hit the lottery. It turns out that that's true on, from lottery winners. We have data that show that people who hit the lottery six months after they won are permanently unhappier than before they bought the ticket. The best thing that can happen to you if you play the lottery is that you don't win. I have the data to show that to you. Which says that we could save a whole lot of money by just not giving out prizes and the, and the, and the whole population would be better off, I suppose. And here's why. Because we have the same information on any source of unearned income. If you don't earn it, it doesn't make you happy. If you don't get it as a source of earning your success from opportunity, it's no good. That's a data-based conclusion. That's an empirical regularity. That's not just philosophy. That is shown in every single study. The truth of the matter is that money doesn't make people happy, and the pursuit only of money will make us all a lot worse off. There's a funny thing that we find in the data. You know what the average unhappiest age in a man's life is? It's identifiable, and it turns out it's the same all over the world, especially in America. When is a man un most unhappy in his life? Close. 45, 45. Now, if you ask, psycho ask psychologists, they'll tell you basically one of two things. It's either, more or less, the age at which your wife definitively figures out that you're boring, <laughs> or it's because you have teenagers in the home, or both. I'm 47, so I'm like on the way up forever, right? Just gets better and better from here, according to the data. One of the real explanations that we find from the data on money, however, is that around age 45, this is when men who have been chasing the money dream figure out that their earned success has diverged from their money path and they can't get from one to the other. There's a lot of life lessons in this stuff. There's a lot that I talk about with my kids. I have data showing that if you inherit money, it won't make you happy. I was talking about this at home one day with my, with my, my research at home with my kids which shows you how much fun it is to have dinner at my house. And, and, and my oldest son, I say, you know, if, if, if you inherit, it doesn't make you happy. It makes you unhappier if you inherit money. And he says, Dad, something's wrong with your data. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we seek? What do we seek if it's not money? And the answer is this. It's called earned success. I just told you that a second ago. Earned success is the belief that you have created value in your life or value in the life of other people. People who believe they have earned their success are the happiest people. Data from the University of Chicago shows that if you take two people who are precisely the same, same age, same race, same religion, same level of education, same everything, and they both feel that they have earned their success and one makes eight times as much money as the second, they will be equally happy. It doesn't matter if you define your earned success or measure your earned success in money or in lives saved or in souls saved or in kids who are literate or people who are lifted up in any way, no matter how you measure your wealth, and all of you as social entrepreneurs measure your wealth, generally speaking, not in money terms, but in the lives that you touch, that is earned success. And that is the promise that our founders gave us and that we have to pass on. Now, there's an opposite to learn, earned success, which is what psychologists call learned helplessness. Marty Seligman, who's a professor of social psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, the maximum uh, expert on the science of happiness, 
talks about learned helplessness that happens to all people when they feel that their merits are disconnected from their rewards. No matter how hard you work, you can't be rewarded for it. And he has these wonderful experiments where he has people in a room and they're, they're presented with piercing, unpleasant noises and they have these buttons to turn the noises off, but he makes it so the buttons don't work. So people are pressing the buttons madly to turn the noises. This is an academic experiment which shows you you can get tenure for anything. And, and they're madly pressing the buttons, but the noises don't turn off, and he finds that within five minutes, they completely give up, number one. Number two, they become miserable. Number three, after the experiment, they start blaming everyone else for their predicaments, including those not involved in the experiment. He presents them with puzzles to solve, and he finds that they're incompetent afterward. People are debilitated if their rewards and their merits are not connected. There's a profound lesson about dangerous public policy, and we can come back to that later, when people learn their helplessness. So what we want is earned success. What's the secret to it? It's a system where skills and passions meet, where people have the ability to keep what they earn, whether it's money or anything else. And that system is what our founders gave us, which is free enterprise. It's not just an economic alternative. It's a moral imperative, but there's another moral imperative as well. Not everybody has the same set of opportunities to avail themselves of the free enterprise system. You know it, and I know it, and everybody in Washington, D.C. knows it. If we believe in free enterprise, like I do, like a lot of you do, probably all of you do at some level, then you know that it is our moral calling to look for better ways to allow more people to avail themselves of a system in which they can earn their success. What am I doing today in education, in entrepreneurship, in healthy cultures, in strong families, in lowering dependency such that everybody can earn their success the way that Jim Wallace and I and you have been able to earn their success. That's an expensive, hard thing to do, but that second moral imperative, as far as I'm concerned, is my calling. Now, I believe in free enterprise very strongly. I lead an institution dedicated to it. Does that mean I believe that we shouldn't have any social safety net? Jim talked about Republicans and Democrats who are cutting a lot of stuff in Washington, D.C. But I'm here to tell you that just because you believe in free enterprise does not mean you have to believe that we don't and shouldn't have a strong and reliable social safety net. Today, if you look at WIC and uh, TANF and food stamps and add it all together, $70 billion. That's one half of 1% of GDP. Add in the part of Medicaid that actually goes to the poor, that's 2% of GDP. That's utterly affordable. Now, everybody knows it shouldn't be wasted. Everybody knows we need to be good stewards. And everybody should know that we have to be careful in the design of programs so that people can earn their success and do not learn their helplessness because that is a profoundly unchristian thing to do. But that does not mean we have to zero out social safety net programs. That proposal, as far as I'm concerned, should be off the table. Here's my last word. I don't like to see what's happening to our country. I don't know, you don't like to see what's happening to our country either. But I believe we have a wonderful opportunity in front of us to examine the moral basis of our system, to come back to the moorings of free enterprise that were the patrimony left to us by our wonderful, wise founders, and apply it to the modern world today. I know that you're in this room because you care about these things. I know that you do what you do to lift other people up. I know that you agree with me when you say that the real inequality problem we have in this country is an inequality of opportunity problem, and you're looking for solutions. That's why it's an honor for me to be with you here today. And for what you're doing for my country, my last word is thank you. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> Well, uh, what do you think, folks? <laughs> A little food for thought there. Well, we're going to jump right in. And uh, I, I wrote down a number of uh, statements and, and thoughts that I, I, I think are really important and uh, are 
uh, CCDA audience really cares about. And uh, I, I want to give you another chance to maybe speak a little bit more about this. Both of you talked about public policy, how the ideas that you all have uh, impact and shape our views about our current public policy. Now, Arthur, you called it dangerous public policy. Uh, Jim, you called it unjust public policy. Uh, what is at the core of what you're talking about? I, I just want you to articulate again, uh, because many of us are part of this American society that is saying, uh, why isn't our country moving? Why aren't we working? Why are we in this gridlock that we find in Washington where we can't get anything done? So how would you describe that? What, 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 what's, what's behind this in specific, uh, you know, Specifically, what, what, how would you articulate that? Well, what I, I said a few moments ago that whether it's Occupy Wall Street, the kids sleeping on the cement, or the business people in Abu Dhabi at the World Economic Forum, there's more and more agreement among some that at least the, this economy is unfair. The kids don't think it's fair. You know, they've got all kind of college debts and can't get a job or half time at Starbucks. Not fair, um, it's not sustainable, particularly ecologically, it isn't sustainable. It's unstable. I mean, those right now nonviolent protests, which I'm glad for, and I said some strong words about that in my letter to those kids. Uh, if there's no change, those protests can become riots as we've seen in England, it's unstable. And it's not making people happy. I mean, the uh, happiness metric Arthur talked about, a lot of people are, are unhappy. So let's focus on opportunity. Uh, Mike Gerson, who was a President Bush's speechwriter and uh, policy advisor, wrote me last week wanting me to join something with him uh, called Opportunity Nation. And uh, Mike's a conservative. Uh, he's not a big government Democrat. But Mike pointed out in the letter how opportunity is declining in this country. We have less social mobility in America now than they have in Western Europe. Less social mobility, less opportunity. That's a problem. And I think it's due in large part to the fundamental inequality that is greater than it's ever been since the Great Depression. Uh, and I, you know, I was talking to these uh, CEOs one time at Davos, they asked me to speak on, uh, the title was, Should We Despair of Our Disparities? And I said to them, well, I know all of you are, are really uh, uh, knowledgeable about, about biblical archaeology. And they all laughed. And I said, when the archaeologists dig down in the ruins of ancient Israel, they find periods of time where the artifacts show a relative sharing of prosperity. No sameness, but no big gaps or chasms. During those times, there were no prophets. No Isaiah, no Jeremiah, no Amos. When they dig down in the other periods, like the 8th century, they find relics of great gaps, mansions and shacks. That's when the prophets rise up to thunder the judgment and justice of God. So inequality is a biblical problem. And it's now greater than ever before. And so when... Uh, so much is controlled by so few, it undermines a sense of belonging and morale and opportunity. We've lost a sense of mobility. Uh, after the Second World War, we had a, a prosperity time in which the rising tide did lift all the boats during that period. Now it's not. Now it's, not. it's lifting the yachts, but not the boats. And many boats are sinking. So I think there's a fundamental problem with such deep inequality that has to, I think, be addressed. I think many of our folks don't have boats at all. That's exactly right. Yeah, so, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Arthur. Well, I'm not going to argue on behalf of the boat owners, let me tell you that. <laughs> um, you know, the, um, there's a lot that we need to worry about in, in our system, but as much as anything else in poor policy. And so I'm going to talk to you about some of the policies that actually led us to where we are, because that's your, your direct question. Mm -hmm. But I do want to address one thing when it comes to when we're talking about income inequality. 
it is true that income inequality is high. The question of whether or not it's a problem for Americans depends on whether or not we sense that there is opportunity. This is something that has always been the case. There's a wonderful survey that was taken five years ago that asked people's opinions about world leaders. Uh, and it was asked to people uh, all, over the, all over the world. And, and I remember the, the contrast between the United States and France on the question of what is your opinion about Bill Gates? This is based back when Bill Gates was still the richest man in the world. Uh, and he's still plenty rich. Now, uh, you, know, the, you know that the, uh, there's, it's a Mexican now that's the richest man in the yeah, world. Yeah, Carlos Slim is now the richest yeah, man so in the world. Just wanted to exactly say right. that. Exactly right. So, right. So, that's right. Point that's right. that out. The, uh, um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't know Jim, how much man. you want to take credit for that. Yeah. The, no, the, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. So, and, and they asked the Americans and the French, you know, what's your opinion Bill, about Bill Gates? And, you know, they gave numbers on their sympathy for him, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, let's cut to the chase. Here's what they were saying. Americans said, I hope my kid is the next Bill Gates. The French said, let's take his stuff and burn his house down. <laughs> what's the difference between French and American society toward the wealthy? The answer is French society is profoundly envious. And American society, when it's at its best, is profoundly aspirational. We need to be looking for a way to make us more aspirational, and we need to walk away from policies that are going to make us more envious. Most of the rhetoric that we hear about income inequality and income redistribution right now, while I understand the discomfort, is actually trying to foment envy in this country. And that's not just a dangerous thing to do. That hurts the poor that actually does a disservice to them. Now, what's the source of a lot of, a lot of the problems that we have right now? The major source, the, the root of the problem that we're facing today right now is bad government policy, a lot of it toward housing. It's crony capitalism, which is the codependent spouse of big government. I, mean, I, I know we don't want to hear this because we want government to do all the right things and it's easier to ask for and get things, particularly from the state, as opposed to saying, look, when the government actually is unaccountable and sets up housing agencies that are encouraging people to make bad housing decisions and handing over exclusive contracts to crony capitalists and, and dealing collusively with people on Wall Street that are misbehaving, we have to face up to these things. The root of many of the problems that we're finding, the current recession, the economic bust, the financial crisis, this came from bad government policy. At very least, we need to address this and make sure this doesn't happen again. Bad decisions came from people who were in power. We're careening toward bankruptcy because of these things. And let's keep one more thing in mind. You know, um, why should we care about deficits and debt and entitlements? Well, yeah. I mean, Jim and I have little kids. and. We don't want them to be saddled with terrible debt. And, and you know, that's not right. It's basically pulling the ladder up from behind us, and, and, and that's immoral. But, but there's something else, too, to keep this in mind. When Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security go bust, who's going to be left holding that bag? Not me. I have enough money in my pension. I have enough money to pay my doctor. It's the poor that are going to pay for that. If entitlements go bust, if deficits take us over, if debt washes over this country, and we cannot continue to be the, 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 a different kind of exceptional country, one based on opportunity, but rather we become a huge grease, the people who are going to suffer the more are your clients, and they're the people for whom Christ says we have to have a preference. That's why that stuff matters. That's why the system matters so much, and we need to take these things seriously. My, Jim? My son... <laughs> My son also uh, 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 thinks Bill Gates, he, he admires Bill, Bill Gates. He admires Bill Gates because he decided to give away half of his wealth. And he's got 92, billion, 92 other billionaires who have made that commitment to begin by giving away half of their wealth. One is Warren Buffett, who now has made the famous <laughs> statement that he thinks it's wrong when his secretary pays a higher proportion of her wealth to the government in taxes than he does. He's saying, he's saying we as wealthy people should pay our fair share. Now, opportunity is a great place to start. Let's remember now that since the war in poverty began, poverty, the rate of poverty was cut by about half. Um, and there are, there are things we made mistakes about, like, uh, cook, 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 like Chicago 
Greeny Green's Howe Housing Project. We've made mistakes that we're correcting, but we're going the other way now. The safety net and things like the Earned Income Tax Credit allows people to have opportunity. So we want opportunity, but it's declining right now. So on the housing issues, you know, uh, this financial crisis was caused not by business or all the banks, but by about six banks who made bad decisions, who bundled all their mortgage securities and engaged in what we now see as greedy and risky behavior. So Elizabeth Warren, who by the way is a, a Methodist Sunday school teacher, when she wants to hold those banks accountable, because they own 90% own of the credit card business, for example, six banks, uh, she's blocked because they're, they're cheating people in your neighborhoods. And that's now clear. So unless you, unless you control the bad behavior of Wall Street and have better government policies, it's a both and. To, to blame just the government as the right does, or to blame just Wall Street as the left does, is a mistake. We are Christians who believe that concentrated power is a dangerous thing because of sin. C.S. Lewis said, we have democracy not because we are so good, but because we often aren't and need checks and balances. So I all often wonder why the right, the conservative side, is so worried about the concentration of power in Washington, but not the concentration of power on Wall Street. Both should be problems for us. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Now, we don't have a lot more time, and I, I want to ask a question that uh, I, I think impacts every one of us in here. Uh, we have about 3,000 people in the room, many of these men and women, young and older. Uh, some have just started, some have been doing it for a long time. Many of them have made a decision to live in neighborhoods alongside the poor, and they're there to, uh, first of all, get to know the poor, uh, build relationships, and to see people, uh, maybe we don't use the language often of gain opportunity, but we want to see them uh, be uh, in, uh, uh, empowered, we want to see them become uh, not necessarily self-sufficient, but we want them to become uh, uh, able to take care of their families. Now, uh, both of you are Christians, both of you are men of faith, both of you have great passion for what you do uh, and, and approaches that you believe are so important. Um, if you could say to the Christian men and women in, sitting down in these chairs, okay, here's what I would want. Uh, if, if Christians would do this, okay, if we would begin to walk out of this room and do these two things uh, that could really empower the poor, what would that be? First of all, pay your tithe. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's uh, you know, like, I know that's not very original. <laughs> All the pastors then, in the room are happy when you say that right now. And uh, give it to CCDA. <laughs> um, yes. And there's Will anything the ushers left, come forward right now? I know. If there's anything left over, Sojourners and the American Enterprise Institute can use a little something, something. But um, this is, it's not original, but let's remember that the, the, the most important way to make meaningful social change, the most important way, is not large-scale coerce, coercive action on the part of government. It's changing our own hearts. This is the difference between the way Christians see the world and non-Christians see the world. You know, there's an old joke that, you know, uh, and, and, and I don't mean this politically, but anyway, I probably shouldn't tell the joke. Anyway, that a socialist, a socialist is a man who loves humanity, but only in groups of one million and above. Now, so take out the politics side of this. People who don't understand the importance of our own hearts believe that the way to change humanity is only in groups of one million and above. That's axiomatically wrong, according to the way that we see the world. So not only pay your tithe, but pay it smart. This is, I work with a lot of people who are very philanthropic. I'm lucky to work with a lot of people who are really philanthropic. And just giving your money away is not enough because it's, 
not necessarily teaching a man to fish. What are we doing in today that, that, that helps people to have a better opportunity society? And then beyond that, what does your tithe really mean? I can tell you what, you tell me what your salary is, I can tell you what 10% is. I'm really fast in the arithmetic, right? But I'm going to have a little bit harder time telling you what 10% of your real treasure is. What does it mean for you to tithe 10% of your love and your affection and your attention and your energy? What does that mean? I don't know. I'm working on that one for myself. I'm working on that one for my kids. But that's actually what smart tithing comes down to in an already rich society. It's not just 10% of our money. It's 10% of what we really hold dear. That's how I would start. <clears throat> well, since we're, since we're telling political jokes, uh, I'll, tell, <laughs> I'll tell one too. There was a guy drowning in the Potomac. Uh, he's about 100 feet offshore, and he's going down fast. So the Republicans rushed down to the river. He's 100 feet offshore. They throw him 50 feet of rope and say, the rest is up to you. <clears throat> the Democrats are sure they can do better. They rush down. He's now really going down 100 feet offshore. Democrats throw him 200 feet of rope and then let go of their end. <laughs> Neither side gets it. And the commitment of CCDA that maybe is most important is what you know, John years ago, and still does, called relocation one of the three R's. Yeah. Your vantage point is the most important thing in understanding all these issues. Yeah. So on the steps of the Cannon office building on that day, I remember Mary Nelson, we, we did, we called it a press conference, it really became a revival. <laughs> and Mary, I remember Mary, what you said, you said, now they're all watching us outside their windows, members of Congress and their staff, and we're all being handcuffed and led away. And Mary says, looked up at them, um, come walk with us. Come and meet the people whose family's nutrition you're about to cut. Come walk with us and meet that young person who's going to go to college on a Pell Grant and now can't come. Come walk with us. So this fall, Lisa Sharon Harper is organizing a big effort. We're calling it Come and See. When your members of Congress are home for their Thanksgiving break, invite them for a Thanksgiving dinner with the poor at your faith-based organization. When they're home for, for recess, have them come and see what you do every day. Help them meet and understand who the people are whose opportunity they're about to cut. Come and see. And then on November 16th, we're going to have circles of protection around faith-based organizations who get some of their help from local or state or federal government who's going to be cut. And we want to circle those places. Your vantage point is the most important thing. And as far as large coercive measures, there was one of those after World War II, when my dad came home from the war. It's called the GI Bill. It allowed a whole generation of young families to buy a house for the first time, or go to college for the first time, large scale. And it really, it really created prosperity for a whole generation. But, surprise, surprise, African-American veterans and their families were effectively blocked from getting the GI Bill. As Lisa says, public policies affect people groups. So, of course, we need empowerment. We need economic development. We need jobs and family. Family is an anti-poverty measure. I tell liberals that all the time. Marriage is an anti-poverty measure. So is a job. Helping people get there to strong families and strong economies and strong, strong, strong jobs is something that sometimes we can't do by ourselves. David Beckman of Redford will tell you, of all the nutrition that's going on in the country, from churches, synagogues, food banks, soup lines, we supply 6% of the need. That's it. And if they make these cuts, they'll wipe out what we do effectively by a pen signing a bill, and they, they don't even know most of what's on the other end of what they cut. They have no idea. So you know what? Invite them to come and see. Yeah. That's what I want you to do. Amen. Amen.
Well, listen, uh, I know that we could go on for a long time. We're actually out of time. And uh, I, uh, I want to thank both of you, Jim and Arthur, for taking the time to help us uh, begin a dialogue and to continue a dialogue throughout the rest of this week. Would you give a great hand to Jim Wallace and Arthur Brooks? Thank you. Thank you much, Ron.